Sir Lewis and Lady Matheson, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a special uh, pleasure to be able to welcome you all to this Monash Jubilee Oscar Mendelssohn lecture. Uh, in particular, uh, we're delighted that uh, Oscar Mendelssohn's son, Dr. Fred Mendelssohn, and his wife, Dr. Jeanette Milgram, are able to be here today. And of course, we're also delighted that Lady Matheson uh, is with us uh, also. The history of the Oscar Mendelssohn lecture is set out on page three of the program, so that uh, I won't uh, say uh, anything about that history other than to draw your attention to the fact that the objective of the Oscar Mendelssohn lecture is to promote the study of humanism, materialism, positivism, and other effects of the application of the scientific attitude to human affairs and thought. And of course, one of the conditions uh, of the lecture is that uh, it should be given by a, a distinguished person who would approach the subject in a scholarly way. Um, today's lecture is a special one uh, because the university has chosen it quite deliberately as part of our Silver Jubilee program. And it's a very special pleasure, I think, uh, on behalf of us all that uh, Sir Lewis has consented uh, to give, to deliver the lecture. Sir Lewis, of course, requires no introduction to today's audience, but for those who wish to test their recollections, the committee have kindly summarised his career on page four of the program. What really is important and not referred to on page four is the deep affection and admiration that he is uh, held in uh, by all of us uh, here today, and in particular by those who worked with him in those halcyon days uh, in which this institution was created. Uh, Lewis's personal charm and qualities of leadership, coupled with uh, uh, an unswerving commitment to excellence, ensured that Monash would be the great university that it is today. We're privileged that uh, Sir Lewis has consented to talk to us about his recollections, and it gives me special pleasure to invite him to deliver this ninth Oscar Mendelssohn lecture entitled Monash, Retrospect and Prospect. Sir Lewis. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> History, said the authors of that memorable book, 1066 and all that, is not what you thought, it is what you can remember. By that definition, what I am going to say to you is indeed history, for it consists mainly of a compilation of some of my most vivid memories of the establishment of this university. I have not done much in the way of reading early council minutes and such like, but I have consulted many of my colleagues of the early 60s to seek their views on what we got right and what would have been better handled differently. The academic and administrative staff who began to assemble in early 1960 found that the interim council, which had held its first meeting under the then Mr. Robert Blackwood in June 19... Uh, that can't be right. <laughs> I can't do the arithmetic quickly enough, but it wasn't June 1985, I can assure you. <laughs> 58. Thank, thank you. Uh, one has to turn to a lawyer for an accurate correction. In June 1958, then, had already taken many far-reaching decisions. The act under which the council was constituted was modeled rather closely on the Melbourne University Act. Few councillors gave serious thought to structuring the new university along different lines from the English provincial model familiar in Australia. The dominant problem was seen as the need for speed so that the capacity of the Victorian university system could match the output 
of the burgeoning secondary schools as soon as possible. The Murray Committee, which had been set up by the Menzies government, reported in September 1957 on the Australia-wide university scene. As a separate exercise, it advised the Victorian government to establish a second general university in this state, rather than the technological university that had been widely canvassed. It also indicated that this would take about six years, although, as emerged later, the last page of its report containing this estimate did not reach the interim council. By accident, one wonders. At any rate, unhampered by any thoughts of 1964 as the accepted opening year, Blackwood and his colleagues set their sights on 1961. In order to achieve this, it was essential to take many critical decisions well ahead of the arrival of the, of the first staff members, who in any case had still to be recruited. The selection of the site was aided by the knowledge provided by demographers that the center of gravity of the metropolitan residential area was moving in a southeasterly direction and would have got to somewhere between Oakley and Springvale by the end of the century. In that region, there were not very many blocks of land of the required size available, and the government eventually agreed to the present site and struck a bargain with the then occupants, the Talbot Epileptic Colony. It is difficult to criticize that choice, and yet it has some serious disadvantages. Public transport is inadequate and expensive, and although parking space is so generous that Monash has been described as a drive-in university, there is a curious belief in Melbourne that it can be reached only by driving immense distances. The sense of isolation is intensified because no local shops and restaurants have developed, and indeed, Recent road developments at the North Road, Dandenong Road intersection have made Monash very hard to reach from the south, certainly on foot. All this has contributed to the moderate success that attempts to turn Robert Blackwood Hall and this Alexander Theatre into a great cultural centre for the southeast have achieved. From time to time, there has been talk of a railway line running from Huntingdale along the line of North and Wellington Roads, but this has never eventuated. In spite of these criticisms, the site has many real advantages, and its development into a showplace for no native trees and shrubs has made it a delight. Only at lunchtime, when the students picnicking on the lawns abandon their litter in a way that would bring them heavy fines in more enlightened countries, does one walk through the grounds with a shudder. The Monash Act and its attendant statutes envisaged a whole academic structure very similar to that in the University of Melbourne. You may remember that at the same time in Britain, plans were also being developed for new universities. In England, Sussex was the pace setter, with a concept designed to get away from the single subject honor schools, which were increasingly thought to be too narrow and restrictive. A new map of learning was devised, involving multi-subject programs taught in schools of European, English, American studies, and so on. Ideas of this kind became de rigueur for new universities in Britain, each of which, in succession, produced its brave new academic plan. Incidentally, only one, the University of Warwick at Coventry, contemplated growing to the size envisaged at Monash. The others thought in terms of 3,000 or so students. I recall Sir Philip Baxter at the Commonwealth Universities Congress in 1963 castigating those responsible for planning tiny universities in cathedral cities instead of building up the provincial universities in the major centers of population. Nevertheless, the Sussex ideas were important and the Monash staff was influenced by them, but there was no time to think out radically new academic plans. In any case, it was known that the faculty system would work. Monash's innovations then had to start from this point. For instance, attempts were made to widen the curriculum by requiring art subjects to take a science subject, and vice versa, but this proved to be too, to be too difficult in practice and has lapsed. Combined degree courses, such as engineering economics, although initiated later for different reasons, may have the effect of bridging the two cultures that was then an objective. A strikingly successful venture has been the development of interfaculty centers 
of which the first was the center of Southeast Asian studies. Although primarily intended for research workers and postgraduate students, these centers, now numbering 16, have become influential at many levels, both inside and outside the university. The site having been obtained and the academic plan decided in principle, the Interim Council's Buildings Committee, which became the de facto planning group, was set up to develop the campus. Sir Osborne McCutcheon was chosen to prepare a master plan, and his work can be seen around us, for very few changes were made as succeeding buildings were put up. One change that was made after much debate was to interchange the library and the union. McCutcheon's thought was to have the library at the center, but the importance of this sensible idea was diminished by the excellent decision to build three satellite libraries. This was at the suggestion of the first librarian, Ernest Clark, to whom Monash owes more than it has so far been ready to acknowledge. Ernest infuriated his academic colleagues by spending so much of his generous budget on acquiring books that the backlog in cataloging became something of a scandal. But 25 years on, we have to be thankful that so many books were bought at prices that could then be afforded, even though only just. It was Ernest, too, who suggested that since we had no alumni, no Bodley or Sheldon, after whom buildings might be named, recourse should be had to distinguished Australians like Hargrave, Deakin, Howitt, and Roberts. The main features of the master plan are the central pedestrian area, the perimeter roads and car parks, the arrangement of the various buildings, work pretty well, but there are some irritations. For instance, there is no real point of arrival at the university as a whole, nor indeed at many of the faculties and departments. Individual buildings were the work of many architects, and it is now rather obvious which are attractive in appearance, which it is good to live and work in, and which have worn well. This is not the right occasion to attempt an audience of these matters, but it would make an instructive exercise for a group of architectural students. The master plan had provided space for residences for some 4,000 students at the northeast and southeast corners of the site. The interim council had decided to refuse requests for grants of land from several bodies and was therefore obligated to establish residential halls of its own. These have developed into well patronized places, each under the care of a member of staff who combines that task with perhaps somewhat reduced duties in his or her department. There are also student flats, and along somewhat more traditional lines, Mannix College across the way is an outpost of the Dominican order in darkest Clayton. All these places now have men and women in residence, and a more informal style of living has developed than was customary in colleges like Trinity and Ormond at Melbourne. Whether students get as much out of living in their university in their university, as their fathers and mothers did, is hard to say. But a more organized and regulated pattern of living is not consistent with how students now like to arrange their domestic affairs. The interim council had been set up by the state government, and the university is constituted under Victorian legislation. The initial negotiations on many important matters were conducted with ministers of the state government and their officers, notably Sir John Bloomfield, Minister for Education, and Sir Ernest Coates, the Director of Finance. But by the time that the Council plans had been turned into financial estimates, the Australian Universities Commission, another of the recommendations of the Murray Committee, was in business. Thereafter, this body, an agent of the Commonwealth Government, played a dominant role in controlling university development. The triennial cycle of formulating submissions enduring the Commission's visitations and subsequently analyzing its recommendations determined the rhythm of our existence. The relationship was never an easy one and the decisions sometimes hard to take, but in retrospect, the mechanism worked pretty well, much better than might have been feared. In a recent paper, Justice Michael Kirby, whose crowded wardrobe contains, among much other head headgear, his bonnet as Chancellor of Macquarie University, advocated federal participation in university governing councils. The Monash Council is widely representative of, of the Victorian community, 
and includes three state parliamentarians, but no Commonwealth nominees. Communications between the University and Canberra are predominantly conducted through the medium of the successor to the University's commission. Now that the cost of running universities and the broad policies that determine their functioning are mainly the responsibility of the Commonwealth Government, perhaps some new channel of communication to Canberra is indeed overdue. Justice Kirby has some other interesting things to say about universities. Although his description of them as independent fiefdoms of opinionated academics, which may once have been true of the ancient universities of Europe, can hardly be said to apply to the state-established institutions of contemporary Australia. Except, of course, that academics who have opinions are eagerly sought, and among them, no doubt, are some who are merely opinionated. The, the process of seeking academics is of great importance, though, and so Justice Kirby's plea for a more openness of administration, including the rights of access by staff to most personnel files, raises some difficult matters. I have no doubt, he writes, that we will see increased demands for access to personnel files, examiners' reports, and the processes of appointment of academics, especially to senior positions. Um, while it is important to respect information supplied in confidence under the present rules, the point I am making is that those rules are likely to change. End of uh, the quotation from uh, Justice Kirby. When the Interim Council reached the stage of making its first appointments in 1959, freedom of information legislation was far in the future, and so the familiar procedure of advertising vacancies and seeking referees' reports in confidence was used. Indeed, it was used with great success throughout my time at Monash, although there were occasions when it was difficult to identify the candidate being interviewed with the description given by his referees. <laughs> If it becomes accepted practice for candidates to have access to written references, then one can see that increasing use will be made of the telephone or of even more clandestine means of communication. Perhaps the Melbourne Club will at last assume the conspiratorial role that it is popular, popularly supposed to play. When I left Manchester, I took with me a small portfolio of ideas that I had collected during my nine years as a professor in that university. One related to the importance of chair appointments. I shall never forget the first selection committee that I attended. It was for an appointment to the chair of physics, left vacant by the departure of Blackett. Rutherford and Bragg had been previous incumbents. The occasion was a solemn one, and we waited in silence for the Vice-Chancellor to open the meeting, which he did by saying, who is the best man in the world for this chair? No one felt able to answer this question, but suggestions were made about whom to inquire from, and so a start was made. At that time, Manchester did not advertise chairs and proceeded entirely by inquiry and confidential responses. It was a slow process, and in the instance I am describing, more than two years elapsed before the new professor took up office. That was when I invented the maxim that my colleagues must often have joked about, a good vacancy is better than a bad appointment. <laughs> Manchester taught me that if you appoint good professors and give them proper authority to discharge the responsibility that a chair should carry, then there is no need to worry about academic standards. This was what we attempted at Monash. In this jubilee year, as we take stock, we could take proper pride in the academic standing that Monash has achieved. The fundamental arithmetic of our university imposed its own logic on many of our decisions. Only eight faculties had been envisaged by the Interim Council, and one, Applied Science, did not seem to be a starter. Medicine was in, but not dentistry. Agriculture did not seem to be necessary, nor veterinary science. So we settled for seven faculties, and so it remains. The fact that three of those faculties, engineering, law, and medicine, are producing future professionals has, I believe, given Monash a stability that would have been lacking if it had been restricted to the liberal arts. The intended speed of development was formidable, 10,000 students in 10 years. And the planned size of 12,000 students meant that each faculty would be as big as some universities. The deans were going to be busy 
especially during the formative years. And the concept of having full-time deans, each devoting his total creative energy to the development of his faculty, soon gained support. The common practice of electing deans for a term of about two years from among the professors of his faculty has the disadvantage that while one incumbent may be active and imaginative, his successor may not, and a thriving faculty may have to languish for his term of office. It is doubtless felt by some that although full-time deans may have been necessary in the 1960s, they have outlived their usefulness. But the problems facing the faculties change from year to year, and new policies have to be thought up, debated, and implemented. In a big university with few faculties, it is likely that the deans will have a demanding job for many years to come. It was a natural consequence of having full-time deans that they could be constituted into a stable and knowledgeable committee which could be relied on for expert advice. The committee of deans, meeting essentially as an advisory body to the vice-chancellor, a sort of cabinet, played a vital role in the development of Monash, although no doubt it excited the suspicions of some who thought that it exercised too much power. So long as the funds allotted to Monash more or less kept pace with its growth, the development of the annual budget could be handled quite well by formula. The role of the committee of deans at budget time was then limited to making sure that the formulae were reasonable and gave more or less acceptable results. But such a system becomes less and less workable as the university approaches the steady state, especially if government funding is constrained. That is when the deans, each of whom has to attend, attempt to satisfy his faculty, lose coherence as a committee and become an assemblage of partisans. Unfortunately, this occurs just when tough decisions have to be taken, when notions of fairness and equality cannot be reconciled with development and progress, when promising ideas can only be supported if projects that have not fulfilled expectations are dropped. Experience shows that universities, however they are structured, find great difficulty in doing this. For this reason, governments have sometimes taken whole areas of decision-making out of the hands of universities, as in the case of the Australian Research Grants Committee. No doubt the Centres of Excellence scheme was also adopted for this reason, and it could easily be that other plans are being studied that will reduce the independence of universities still further. Faculties, by definition, are aggregations of departments having scholarly relations with one another. To be sure, there are some areas of study, psychology for example, which do not sit un unambiguously within one faculty rather than another, but in practice this does not seem to cause much difficulty. It is curious that the legislation of many universities does not pay much attention to the department as a structural unit in the system, since it is common experience that the department is the real basic building block of the university. This is certainly true of the pure and applied sciences, and I think also of arts. At Monash, law and education seem to get on quite well without developing a departmental structure, perhaps because they are rather smaller faculties than some. In science and arts, big departments like chemistry and history, physics and English were inevitable. There were bound to be several professors in each and the question of chairmanship thus arose. This is where the requirements of orderly and effective government with a clear line of responsibility through faculty and professorial board to council, where the authority to appoint chairman ultimately resided, could be, see, could be thought to conflict, conflict with the notion of a university as a democratic society of scholars with perhaps some slightly more equal than the others. Certainly the circumstances of Monash in the early years precluded the endless debates, the procrastination, and the difficulties attendant on reaching and living with decisions that characterize some universities. No doubt there are dangers in having chairman of departments appointed by council from among the professors, but it is possible to devise safeguards that will be effective in most circumstances. By contrast, the system of electing chairman from, staff, from the staff generally, or from those above a certain level of seniority, carries different but no less serious risks, of which the most serious is that candidates may seek and perhaps gain election as chairman for reasons that have little to do with the real duties of the position. 
nor does it seem to me reasonable to appoint a professor with a responsibility to develop the teaching of and research in his subject without giving him corresponding authority. Each of the faculties had its own problems to solve, but the decentralized system of government that was being developed enabled most of them to be dealt with internally, where changes in or the enactment of regulations or statutes were required the professorial board and council became involved, and occasionally, when different faculties to, took different lines on an issue, debate could be heated and prolonged. For example, Monash decided that its faculty of education, although established with the prime purpose of providing courses leading to the diploma of education for intending teachers, would not be restricted to this task. Some very distinguished people were appointed and many initiatives were implemented. <clears throat> One proposal that was not accepted was to introduce education subjects concurrently with the students' main discipline taught in the faculties of arts or science. It was a great disappointment to the first dean, Richard Selby Smith, when, for no doubt sound reasons, arts would have none of this, preferring that the first degree should be completed as a preliminary to studies in education. The Faculty of Arts had problems of its own which were hard to resolve. While the departments of English and History soon developed into large operations paralleling physics and chemistry and science, there was little prospect of the language departments developing in such a way. For organ organizational reasons, there seemed to be a case for linking related languages into, for instance, departments of Romance languages, Germanic languages, or Slavonic languages. But this plan did not find for favor with those most concerned. It is at least possible that the problems were more personal than scholarly, but that is a thought that ought only to be mentioned sotto voce. Whatever the reason, separate departments, each primarily devoted to a single language, were adopted, and they have inevitably remained quite small. Science always seemed to be in good control of its destiny, but engineering has had a number of problems, at the outset, there was some discussion about trying to get a unified course going on Oxbridge lines, but this did not find favor, and the departments more familiar in Australia were adopted. One of these is chemical engineering, which, in spite of its growing importance, had been conspicuously neglected in Melbourne. Engineering has always had difficulty in attracting adequate numbers of appropriately trained local students for reasons that are characteristic of the contemporary Australian lack of understanding of how the world is going. The shortfall has been eagerly filled by excellent students from Southeast Asia who are more perceptive. An uneasy situation has developed because Monash and New South Wales take the bulk of overseas students while the other universities impose tight quotas. Medicine, of course, is sui generis and comes complete with its own array of prejudices and problems. The Interim Council was persuaded by its two medical members, Rod Andrew and Maurice Ewing, to provide room on the campus for a teaching hospital. The plan was that with a medical school and the biological sciences close at hand, the clinical departments of surgery and medicine would at least have the opportunity of de developing cooperatively. This plan was accepted by the then state government but for all sorts of reasons was gradually left behind. The problem of the day, unbelievable as it now seems, was to produce more doctors quickly. Urgent plans had to be made to adjust the clinical teaching arrangements that had been developed by the University of Melbourne so that the hospitals south of the era changed their affiliation to Monash. It need hardly be said that there was much heart burning over this. The ad hoc decisions and the improvisation that accompanied the setting up of the medical school were, I now think, a particularly unfortunate consequence of the speed of Monash's establishment. The grand plan envisaged by Andrew and Ewing was diluted. New ideas about medical education, such as starting with a three-year first degree in science slanted towards biology, followed as a second operation by another three years of medicine, never got serious consideration. We have finished up with yet another typical Australian medical school, of high standard, no doubt, from which students are now to be excluded because of the glut of doctors. It is not surprising that it is likely that the empty places will be sold in the marketplaces of Singapore and Hong Kong. It has to be conceded, though, 
that the loss of the campus hospital was not all on the debit side, at least as far as the university as a whole was concerned. While the possibility of a new coherence in medical, te <coughs> medical teaching certainly became more remote, a big hospital right in the grounds could have brought all sorts of problems. So in retrospect, one can have some regrets and some reliefs. Prospect must recognize that the move of the Queen Victoria Hospital to, to Clayton will bring a new set of challenges and opportunities. Excuse me. <clears throat> no retrospective account of Monash can ignore the student difficulties of 1967 to 1971 and again in 1974. Although after more than a decade their impact has faded, there can be no guarantee that similar events will not recur as they have done elsewhere. And so it is, it is valuable to recall some of the main features of that unhappy time. The period when this happened was of course critical. The Vietnam War was in progress, conscription of young men was possible and in fact was eventually instituted. A key element was the knowledge that in America great universities beginning with Berkeley in 1964 had been brought to a standstill. Even more tempting was the knowledge that many of the most respected and able university presidents, like Clark Kerr of California, whom Governor Reagan fired with enthusiasm, had been toppled, not to mention the blows that the students of the Sorbonne had be able to, been able to inflict on no less a person than the formidable de Gaulle. Why, the radical students of Monash must have said to themselves, don't we have a go at Matheson? Radical groups of people, more or less violently revolutionary, are a fact of life in the world today, in universities no less than in other parts of society. In Monash, the Labour Club was such a group, and with skillful leadership, it created the circumstances in which the student body at large could be persuaded to join in quite uh, extensive insurrections. Part of this success was because an exciting, exhilarating atmosphere was created when students, tired after a morning's lectures, could flock into the forum and listening to lunchtime rhetoric might imagine that they were reforming the world. It is now clear that the Monash experience conformed very closely to that el elsewhere. The many worthy citizens who jumped to the conclusion that because Monash was the first Australian university to experience student unrest, it was uniquely wicked, had to think again when Melbourne, La Trobe and other Australian universities were even more seriously affected. By 1970, some 700 colleges in the United States alone had had their troubles, so Monash's uniqueness lay only in its youth. The staff in the early 60s was far too preoccupied with getting the place going to, make, to pay much attention to faraway California and its troubles. Not that foresight or even forewarning would have been much help, for no one really knew what steps to take in the face of what turned out to have all the implacable power of a tidal wave. It would be wise to use the present peaceful period to try to think out strategies that might be effective in the future. There seem to me to be two complementary approaches, one being to reduce the effectiveness of whatever radical groups are around at the time. For instance, it is vital to develop an understanding with television station managers on what is tolerable behavior in TV crews, whose mere presence on campus is apt to be provocative. If a student who demonstrates at noon can go home and watch himself on the evening news, his behavior is promoted from being mere hooliganism to a serious historical incident. Student leaders become very adept at using television cameramen and even producers for their own ends. University administrators should aim to develop similar skills. The second thrust should be directed towards the student body at large. Where the student revolt was successful, it was not so much because there were radical groups on campus who were actively promoting discord, as because they were able to mobilize thousands of students who were disaffected, resentful of the way society was treating them, and no less seriously, resentful of the way their university was treating them. Here I do not just speak of Monash. Indeed, it could be that the comparatively restrained responses of the student body to the barrage of propaganda reflected a degree of satisfaction with what the infant university was trying to do. The rather surprising result to many students of the referendum 
that attempted to gauge opinion on the fate of certain students convicted of disciplinary offences showed that support for their antics was very limited. This is the time for the university to look at itself, to find out the day-to-day -day experience of the ordinary stu student, to seek out discourtesies and injustices, to eliminate pedestrian teaching, to ensure that assessment is fair and equitable. These are things that universities should be doing continually, but often fail to do. If they do, and their students feel that they are really members of a just and caring society, there is at least a chance that the next time the radicals are on the rampage, their protests will not swell into a, a revolution. Now to a more general matter. The discipline st statute of the 60s and 70s was far from satisfactory, as I know very well because I wrote it myself. I hope that it has been modified, but I wonder if it has yet acknowledged how the academic world has changed. The days when universities were self-contained societies firmly committed to a role in loco parentis are over. Should they any longer attempt to judge and punish students themselves, except perhaps for purely academic offenses? The parking regulations, which were once a potent source of conflict, are now effectively administered by external authorities. Why should this principle not be extended? It could then no longer be objected that the university was judge as well as prosecutor in its own case. There was one result of the situation of the 70s that was particularly disappointing. This was the fate of the Monash University Scientific and Industrial Community, whose perhaps unfortunate acronym was MUSIC. The University of New South Wales, many years before, had established UniSearch, a wholly owned company whose function was to act as a channel of communication between industry and university experts. Promising discoveries are patented and marketed and contracts negotiated between industrial or, co or commercial clients and workers in appropriate fields. The scheme has been very successful and has frequently been imitated, but not at Monash. Our professors did not like some aspects of UniSearch and believed that their own contacts with industry were adequate. Indeed, there has been much valuable collaboration in engineering, medicine, science, and economics. From the earliest days, there have been attempts to encourage research organizations and science-based industries to establish themselves close to the campus. And a number of CSIRO divisions and telecom research laboratories have done just this. However, the available land was soon used up and a different strategy was attempted. This was to set up music, an organization whose sole purpose was to make it easier for interested individuals and firms to find their way to appropriate departments and workers in the university. The details of how this was to be done were never fully worked out because the scheme attracted such a hostile reception that it was thought wise for it to be dropped, at least for the time being. Propaganda from the labor club was to be expected, but the hysterical description of music by otherwise responsible members of staff as a takeover of the university by the military industrial machine was very disheartening, but such was the climate of the times. As the years have gone by, Australian industry has declined and opportunities for original and enterprising people have dwindled. What a pity that music was prevented from making even quite a small thrust in a more productive direction. Now, 15 years later, Monash is at last to start a consulting company but there is no longer as much opportunity for daybreak enterprises to start here as they have done around Cambridge Mass and Cambridge Inn. If the university should decide to embark upon a thorough review of its educational processes, then it could well begin at the beginning. The present procedures by which young people progress from school to university are hard to defend, and there is no certainty that the changes to HSC now in train will be any better. So long as it is national policy to make university places available to the present small proportion of the relevant age group, there is not much that a single university can do. But there may be now be an opportunity for a proposal that founded in 1963 to be revived. This was that Monash should establish a school of preliminary studies, which would have provided within this university an organization akin to the junior colleges of California. Students in that state whose school preparation and achievement are not quite up to the level of Berkeley or UCLA 
can enter a junior college and, after a successful two-year course, either transfer to the university or complete a terminal course leading to a certificate or other qualification. The Californian plan is not directly transferable to Victoria, but something appropriate to the local scene could undoubtedly be worked out. The idea must be not to deprive an aspirant of any possibility of attending a university just because his HSC score is a point too low. Young people develop at greatly different rates. The circumstances of their school ed education can differ greatly. Elementary common sense, to say nothing of justice, requires that if they slip down a snake at HSC, there is, is at least one ladder within the reach of a climber. Much the same thought applies to our own undergraduate courses, which are closely tailored to the needs of a hypothetical average student. But some are much brighter than the average, and others think better at a slower pace or prefer to spend part of their energies developing other interests or talents. Do we make sufficient opportunity for such students to proceed through a course at a different rate from the norm, faster or slower, as the case may be? One of the advantages of the full-time dean system is that there is a senior person available in each faculty who has the independence and detachment to give serious thought to matters of this kind. As I come to the end of this inevitably incomplete look at Monash, past and future, I find myself thinking nostalgically about the year 1960 and recalling the enterprise and enthusiasm with which the new members of staff, as they arrived, set about their work. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, said Wordsworth, about a very different sunrise, and to be young was very heaven. The sense of common purpose was naturally very strong. Were we not a bunch of pioneers determined to save Victoria from its impending educational price process, crisis, and in the process built a, build a first-rate university? There were some shattering disappointments as when the Oakley authorities fixed a stop work notice on the first building on the grounds that the proper permit had not been obtained. But on the whole, people were cooperative and a contractor who had to struggle with a very muddy site through a wet winter did amazingly well to get us ready to open for teaching in less than a year. The wives of the staff formed a women's society, still going strong, which assumed the task of helping newcomers to settle in. The university had undertaken to find temporary accommodation for all who needed it, but even so, a helping hand was often welcome. Eventually, flats were built and the wives arranged rosters of visitors for the tenants, a practice which continues to this day. Annual events were the children's party in the garden of the vice chancellor's house and the Guy Fawkes bonfire on November the 5th, which lasted only a year or two until uh, they, it was pronounced too dangerous after someone dropped a cracker in the fireworks box. All this produced a sense of goodwill and comradeship in those who shared in the common task, which helped us to make light of the hard work and long hours. Inevitably, as new generations of students and staff replaced the pioneers, the original satisfaction of creating something new gives way to feelings more relevant to the contemporary world. Unfortunately, it is a world much less sympathetic to universities and what they stand for than the world of 1960. How to thrive in this world, or even just to survive, is the task of our successors. We wish them well. I'm going to ask Professor Louis Waller, who is acting chairman of the Oscar Mendelssohn Committee and, of course, our eighth Oscar Mendelssohn lecturer, to propose a vote of thanks on our behalf. Professor Waller. Vice Chancellor, Mr. Chancellor, <coughs> Sir Lewis Matheson, Lady Matheson, ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, Alfonso of Castile called the wise, who said, if I'd been present at the creation, I would have uh, given some useful hints on the better arrangement of the universe. <laughs> we have been uh, privileged today to
to hear from one who was present at the, at the creation and uh, in some significant measure was the creator of, uh, of this universe, of this universe of discourse, of this universe of men and women, which stretches back 25 years and stretches forward, we hope, to uh, a future which will go on forever and ever. And uh, we have enjoyed, we've been uh, engaged, we've been stimulated by what you have told us today from uh, well-remembered and uh, well-thought-through and very well-chosen recollections of those uh, years properly described as halcyon, because that word brings the, uh, the rush of wings of the kingfisher that uh, must have been felt by you and your colleagues as you came together to establish what all of us who are part of it, in whatever way, do acknowledge is a great university. Thank you very much. That concludes the jubilee oration. Thank you.